All right, we'll get into it. Yeah. So we covered some of our financial policies last Thursday, and we've got a couple more to do, which are development contributions policy. It's quite a fun one. And then rates and emissions policies. <laughs> so I'm going to start with um, development contribution policies, then I'm going to get out of here. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, DCs, I'm going to do a real quick one on one um, for anyone who's not familiar. Uh, whenever we build something, and this is a fictional example, but there's a there's probably a good example happening in Mankakino at the moment. At the moment, we've got a big wastewater treatment plant out there. I think late last year or earlier this year, we just got a resource consent for that. Um, and the environmental standards are a lot higher, so we'll be building a new plant out there, quite a big, expensive project. Um, and we've been talking with EWI, who've got some growth aspirations out there. So when we build the plant, we've got to right size it for what we think growth will be in the community. So we take the cost of the plant, we take out any external funding, if there is any. Um, for roads, obviously, we get GTA funding. Occasionally, we get government funding for other things. We're required to take out any benefits to the existing community. So if we're building a whole new plant, we had an old one. There's some renewal or replacement benefits there. Um, there's upgrades, there's environmental benefits, um, improvements to service levels, uh, resilience. Obviously, when we build new stuff, it's usually better standard. So all that stuff is funded by rates as normal. Um, and then we look at how much extra we're we building to allow some growth. Any of that growth that's already happened and we're sort of catching up, that is also funded by rates. But then the top share, the growth component, we identify and we extract and we set that aside. And we have a policy that says growth should be funded from growth. So anytime someone develops a new lot of sections, they take a big lot and chop it into 16 residential sections, they'll pay a fee 16 times to contribute to the growth projects that allow houses to then be built on them. So we've put in capacity that allows those houses to happen um, and they fund it rather than the existing community. Um, and this has been around for, for quite a long time, a couple of decades. Um, and it came about because there were councils that were growing rapidly and they simply couldn't afford to invest in growth on the back of the existing rate base. So this gives them a revenue stream it puts the costs with the people who cause the, the need um, and it allows them to borrow and set that all aside and invest ahead of the growth happening. So that's DCs in a nutshell. Five questions as we go. Any questions? Yeah, one question. One question. Just, just for that basic simple example, um, so say you've got an existing community, but okay, a wastewater plant. The wastewater plant is fine for the existing community, okay? But, but you've got a whole <coughs> bunch of new development. Okay, you either expand the wastewater plant or you build a new one. So is that is that literally saying that's right? The that's DCs clear. will fund 100% of that yep. new wastewater plant. Yep. And there are projects we do that we say are 100% growth. Um, mm -hmm. For example, we've got a again a wastewater pipe heading out to the the EUL land, which is currently sized whatever its size and needs yes. to be sized a bit bigger. We're only doing that to support growth. So that's a 100% growth project, 100% um, funded through development contributions. And, and to, to, okay, say it's $10 million for the wastewater plant. Divide that by, where well, well, you, you, you take a spurious figure, okay, there's a thousand houses, say it's all residential. Is it 10 million divided by 1,000? You've got to give, give that, and, and that's as simple as that. It's more complicated than that, but that is exactly the principle. Yeah. So for the EUL land, we know we're expecting 2,500 houses out there. We're right sizing all that infrastructure to cater to 2,500 houses. We'll divide all those costs roughly by 2,500 houses, plus all the finance costs that go with it, depending on when we think we'll get the revenue in, the fact we have to borrow to build it. So with that pipe, you get 2,500. Well, but, 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 not, not all development happens at once. It might, it right. might or the economy might drop and it might drag out over 10 years. That's right. So, but you've got to build your pipe. That's right. So that's all debt funded. Yeah, debt funded. Right. So, yeah. so you take a little bit of a risk on that, depending on yes. uh, when you have to put it in place and when you expect the growth to happen. But we, we forecast that and we include a financial component reflecting that we expect to get this money over time and there's interest costs from doing yeah. that. And that's all accrued back to DCs as well. So there's some quite complicated financials are behind this, but the principle is quite simple. And those DCs don't get paid till the title comes through, is that normal? Is that I believe the... that's correct, yeah. So they're, they're liable when they subdivide, um, but I think they typically pay it when they when they build and they have their revenue. Is that right, Nick? 
Yeah, it's not usually when CCC's issue. So when it's when the title comes through, the developer gets an invoice. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, right. So this is just the time frame again to say that um, some of these projects we'll be planning for in advance, like the bridge. Currently got that in the LTP. We know that's going to cater to growth. Um, even though we haven't built it yet, we are collecting money and setting that aside for when we do build it. And then after we've built it, we'll be collecting revenue from that growth as it happens over time. So this is money we're collecting typically over a 25 year period or whenever that growth occurs. Um, and so the financial costs are quite significant, up to 40% cost for some of these projects. So that's a bit of the time frame. Um, a little bit of the history now. So back in 2018, we were in about the middle of the pack with our DCs, charging just under 20,000 a section, uh, more or less. Um, but this was at a time when we'd had huge amounts of growth, right? Since 2013 till now, we've total has grown about 20%, huge growth. Um, so all the spare capacity we thought we had pretty much got used up. And all these growth projects we sort of had planned at some point became urgently needed. And they went from being sort of a conceptual, we need a pipe to actually we need this size pipe, we need it here, and this is what it's going to cost. So we had quite a, a jump in the growth projects planned. Um, and the cost of those projects too. So we've gone from the middle of the pack to, we're pretty much at the top of the pack now. All those councils at the top are sort of the growth councils that are dealing with large growth and they've got some big growth projects in there that they're trying to fund. Okay. Um, yeah. sorry. You may be getting to this, I'm sorry if you are. Mm. Um, is the calculation different for commercial development, so residential? There's a, there's a conversion. Um, so, so most of our charges are based on per household lot, yeah. and we convert um, commercial to a household equivalent through some clever way. So, a policy sets out all the details of how that's done, um, but but more or less, there's there's room to negotiate too. If they can prove actually, this is how much water will we use, this is how much wastewater we need, we'll negotiate on whatever actually we need to cover the growth. So, we've kind of got a an average in the policy, which is what we expect, unless you know otherwise. Um, but there is room to say, actually, my development doesn't fit your neat box. It is something different, and we can have mm. around that. So, the likes of Narodo, they are paying 45 odd grand. Yeah, yeah, 42. Has any developers seen this growth? Uh, no, but they know what they're paying. This isn't a surprise to them. Um, yeah. This is, I've put in. Um, an estimate for land prices at the moment. So this is a bit higher than it was even back in 2021 when we were looking at this. And you can see there's a number of councils there, I've put 2023 in red there, who've updated their policy recently and they've all jumped up quite a lot. So there's a lot of councils facing a lot of cost increase, even for stuff that they've, they, they were planning to build and they built the next year, the cost has gone up a lot, or they were planning to build in three years time, the cost has gone up a lot. So there's a lot of councils are gonna be struggling with this DC and these will be coming up. But I guess the key message here is we're already near the top of the pack, so we're going to be conscious. We've got a lot of growth projects. How are we going to fund those? Um, and what is our limit here before it starts to have a real impact? Also, when we put this up in 2021, the, the market was pretty buoyant. Uh, property prices had gone up a long way. The property developers, they were doing fine. Um, the only objections we got were from people who'd, uh, who'd already sold some sections and they'd signed an agreement with us that they would pay the DC at the time. And they were surprised by the change and that, that left them out of pocket. But most people just pass it straight on to the person who buys the house, right? So as long as it's transparent, everyone pays the same, competitive market's still there, um, they're able to pass it on. They want to know what it is um, and they want to make sure that we're enabling the growth. So um, if we don't fund these projects and they can't develop, that's not good for them either, right? Is that across the district, that formula? Uh, we have different catchments. So Topol we split into Topol South, which is essentially EUL, Topol North, which is essentially north of the bridge, and Marpra. And we've got Topol Central, which is kind of the east and some of the commercial land. Um, and then we've got Kinloch's its own area. Um, otherwise, we've got uh, not much else around the rest of the district at the moment, but that's going to change. Uh, Manga Kino is likely to come in in this DC policy because of that particular project I talked about. Um, down in Turangi, previously we weren't forecasting a lot of growth. 
we hadn't planned a lot of growth projects, that might change. We might now have some growth projects and we might now need to include a DC down in two lanes. Um, but no, mostly it's cut off by um, segment and looked at the specific infrastructure needed for each segment. And they are quite different. Um, but for Topo and Kinlock, they're largely around the, the 40. If you're in the rural area, obviously you're not having a connected water, you're not having a connected wastewater, you pretty much only pay the transport charge, which is about um, 7,500, including GST. What about this new new section that among Kino? Ten about ten there, is there? No, ones that are already there. Just been built. Yeah, they were already paid the DCs. Yeah, they paid DCs. If they've subdivided, they they would have paid. Yeah, and I don't think there's any specific DCs for Mankakino. So typically, um, we, we zone areas where we know what the infrastructure costs are going to be. And if you're outside that area, we come and have a chat and say, oh, we'll look at what's needed. And if you need some new pump stations to get the water up, we'll expect you to pay for that. So within the DC is where we've done the work. We know what the projects are. We can assure you that if you pick up there, we can connect you. And here's what the cost will be. Outside our DC catchments, it's a case by case assessment. Rachel? Um, we've had discussion, as you know, with the KRG about DCs in a particular area only being spent in that yep. area. But that if that's not the intention of separating no, that thing out, the, or it is. That is the intention. I think that's the so problem. whatever DCs are collected in that area go to that area. That should be ring fenced. I I think that's the thrust of our current policy. We've really changed. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be the specific project that we collect for, um, but it should be the purpose that we collect for. So if growth we, of that region. If we that, think, that, yeah. If we think we need a, a bridge to deal with the, the congestion, but actually we come up with some other design, it's not a bridge, but still dealing with the congestion, that's acceptable. But it should be to deal with congestion, not safety or mm -hmm. some other conditions. And given that it's quite a lot that we are collecting, more than we expected, what happens to that budget? Does it just keep you know keep putting it away for a rainy day? For that or can we then use it in an area that perhaps didn't collect enough DCs. So, so we're not collecting more than we expected. These are the rates that we set three years ago. Mm. And I imagine that all the costs of the infrastructure we've built and planning to build have su superseded what we expected back in 2021. So I imagine we are collecting more. I mean, the waters are the, the killers for us. Um, and so I'll quickly probably talk about the transition to the new entity if that happens. Um, at the moment, they've signaled that they would like us to keep collecting DCs for them. And even if we don't include the projects in our LTP, we're allowed to collect DCs on their behalf up until the point that they can take over. Um, so at this point, if if we go by that, our policy will keep going with the waters, which is the, the bulk of the cost here. I'll just talk about... Oh, first, just, just, a, just a question. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, so we are top of the pack, really. Yeah. Is, isn't that... Um, I mean, like a place like Selwyn has boomed since the earthquake. And are we saying we're doing so much more stuff than everyone else? Is it? I mean, that's kind of, are we really? It's what what's going on? our particular infrastructure needs. So Selwyn might happen to have a huge water treatment plant that's got a ton of capacity and they don't have to worry about this issue. Whereas if we have to put in a particular pipe to service growth, we have to put in a particular pipe to service growth. So, so we, we are top of the pack building uh, the most stuff of all the provincial places in the country. That's yes. sort of what it's saying, isn't so, it? So, Couple couple caveats on this. Um, this data isn't perfect. I've, I've run through the DC policies at a quick clip, pulled out their figures. I haven't gone into the detail of the metrics behind this. There are some areas that are certainly more than this, where they have to put in specific bridges just for a, a small catchment, or they've got particular issues for a small catchment where the DCs are quite high. Uh, particularly in Waipa, there's a, there's a few issues like that. Um, but but the point is, and this is not unusual, that there's kind of there's a growth pack that's in and around that high 30s to 40s mark, um, and we're already in and amongst that pack. Um, and, and probably there's not too much room for us to jump much higher, is, the, is probably the key message. And then there's some other, there's another pack in around the 30k mark, uh, who obviously don't have quite the infrastructure challenges that we do. I might just, do, do, excuse me, might, might just join you. Um, I'm a bit more, than, was a bit more nuts and bolts face. Um, Aiden's a bit more on the policy side here. So um, probably just to, Specifically on that question, that's probably about as high as it gets. It's not the average. Um, as Aidan said, um, we've got different categories for different areas. Um, that's probably Taupo South, which is the very highest figure. Um, it includes the 4% for reserves. 
which in most cases the developer just gives us, us land. So it's credit back to them. So it's probably 10,000 worth of it typically. Um, probably in Taupo Town here, we've reached a $1,000 reserve contribution. It's around low 20s. So if you're in the CBD area, um, if you're in Manga Kino, the example we've had, you've paid transportation, which is district wide, um, community infrastructure. And um, what are District wide, district wide parks. So that's probably a total of under 10,000. So, so, although we appear at the top of the pack, there, in fact, that's far from the average as to what. So, it's, it's actually probably the worst case typical example. Right. Yeah. But, but South Oak, North Oak, Walk, and Lock, there are major greenfield areas where most of the growth is happening. So, um, those charges about 30 to 30,000 plus 10,000 in land, it's pretty much what people are facing. Well, that's because we've got such big infrastructure. We've got the new reservoirs to go on the west there, the pumping stations, um, the pipeline that I'd mentioned about coming back to service them all. So they are really big ticket items, and, and certainly we're not over collecting on those. I just thought I'd jump in there and Thank just you. give a little bit of finer Thank detail. You. Thank so, you, Roger. So the next one. So I, I guess the key message is we're already running out of room in the DC space. Um, here's what it was based on last time is the grey. So our charges of around 42 at the, at the top um, is based on about 85 million of planned or some completed um, expenditure. Uh, some of that has been occurring. Some of those are projects that are still to happen. Um, so we know there's potential for significant cost increases since 2020, really, when we were planning these. Um, on top of that, there are potentially some major growth projects coming through. So currently we've got the bridge in there so that we're collecting something from growth. Um, once the growth has happened, we can't go back and collect it. So we've, we've got a bridge in there, but at the moment the cost estimate is 20 million and it's only 50% share for growth. So we've got 10 million we're trying to collect through DCs. Currently we're looking at a, a bridge much more expensive than that. I think about 60 million. And the, the figure talked about is maybe 75% of that is growth. Um, so if we're going to try and collect that through DCs, we're going to have some challenges. So the private plan change, 700 odd sections up mm. there, obviously massively bridge. Have they already, those developers, been using this new number, the 40k, on the resource piece here? Um, I don't think they're at that stage yet, but, but that's the current policy that would apply to them until we change it. And we'll... We're required to review this and update it with the LTP. Yeah. Transportation is district wide. Everybody pays the same rate, no matter where you are, because the decision is taken that everybody uses the roads that benefits from them. So, you know, the Manga Kino or Turang, you pay exactly the same as you if you're a developer on the north side at the moment. It's not targeted. And again, uh, the challenge would be if we do introduce a large bridge project with a huge growth component. Whether or not we can still use that assumption. Is it still fair for development and turning like pay for what is essentially one project up here? Mm -hmm. um, so that might challenge the assumption. And then there's also a couple of wastewater um, solutions that are potentially being planned north of the bridge um, as alternatives to putting a second pipe across the river. Um, and they're pretty expensive and largely to allow growth on that side of the river. Um, so again, um, if we're going to include those as growth projects and try and DC fund them. Uh, we might run out of headroom again. So not not rosy news, but that's where we're at. Uh, and just, you know, there has been some districts have deleted their DCs because to enable growth over the years, GFC and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's a policy that, you know, I, I like because, you know, mainly in existing ratepayers, you know, the new development is paying itself. But there are, you know, there is, some districts that are deleted over the years because they got no growth. Yeah, and there are a lot of rural areas that, that don't do this. But I, I was looking at provincial areas, yeah. and um, whereas in 2018 there were a few that chose not to charge them to try and encourage growth, yeah. almost everyone's charging them now. Yeah. So on the flip side, there will be areas out there which are 100% are charging for a growth project, and they just get they just get walloped really hard, and that's just the way it is. But it all comes down to the infrastructure needed to support that growth. And what that yes, yes. Well, yeah. like a wastewater plant, yeah. you're going to pay. This is all due to you. You're going to pay. Well, well, well. Would you get like 
hundred thousand development contribution because we've just got to build this stuff. Uh, I mean, th these are sort of average figures, but would you get to the extremes where you, where that that is expected? These these are largely the figures that people could pay. So I don't see any any examples as high as that. Um, just about be the maximum that we charge at the moment. The, yeah. the only sensitivity in that top figure is the land value that the developer would best for land. And typically, because the vesting land that's a higher value, because it's, it's in the same area that they're developing, that it ends up coming out neutral. So that pretty much is the most extreme example. And it's using Taupo South figures, which are the highest for water. No, I'll just think of examples like, like Waihi Beach. I mean, I don't know, it's probably not a development contribution. Waihi Beach, ocean erosion. Someone had to build a stone wall. These were existing houses. But the whole of Waihi did not pay for their stone wall to protect their houses. So yeah. that's sort of. So there can be separate requirements. Um, if it's not a DC area where you say, hey, we don't guarantee you can build there subject to these charges, that'll be a bespoke charge based on what you need. Or there could be resource consent requirements um, where you're required to, to rectify or fund something and always get your approval. So so there may be, but generally, there's a zero yeah. charge we're talking about. Sorry, through the chair. So for residential, you that's the blanket amount that you pay. You don't pay more than that. If you're within our mapped growth areas, we'll connect you if you pay. Okay. okay. So it's quite different for commercial then. At the moment, at the, uh, as a result of 2021, commercial pays exactly the same for, for water and wastewater in the area. So one lot of commercial pays the same as we have a generous there's a category called high water user, which we call 10 cubic metres a day. So pretty much if up to 10 cubic metres a day, you don't, you just pay the standard residential connection. We find most businesses actually don't use much water. So less than a house, and they certainly don't irrigate their lawns and same. So an administration became very difficult to try and work out what split what one aluminium windows factory versus someone else who did, did something else to try and versus the supermarket. So there's probably only a, one like a, a countdown supermarket or a Bunnings or, or a minor 10 which would go over 10 cubic meters per day now so the, the implementation of it's so much easier um, and in some cases before people paid less because based on the floor area so it's just set, we've just decided for simplification and that's what the count committee decided with council decided last time we just make them the same they, they, but they, they don't pay reserves. Significantly more than forty thousand dollars for like one section potentially. No, do they? Yeah. Do they? Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't. They don't, they don't pay reserves. <laughs> um, if they were on, on the previous policy, the two thousand and eighteen policy, yes, there, there's, a, there's a factor there. But unless you go over the ten thousand litres per day under the twenty twenty one policy, you you'll pay the same as the residential side. Okay, I need to look into that a little more. So, so say Mr. Poynton pulls down many kinds pharmacy and rebuilds. No, that's just replacing existing. He, he, he doesn't have to pay DCs. Right, but uh, Spark Point. What about a BS commercial section and you'll build a new building? So if you develop a big commercial section at the moment, the developer pays one residential equivalent for water, wastewater, transportation on, on the site. Yeah. And Unless your land, your land, the activity you put on uses more than ten cubic meters a day, there was no more. No, no DCs. No more DCs. Not when you come to build. Is that kind of a consistent thing around the country, or is it, uh, do you know, or the way of doing it? I'm sorry, I'm not really that familiar with what I, I, I comment on what other councils do, but it was became a, quite, a really difficult thing to administer having. Both the, tra the transportation, the waters, the wastewater is all on factors of what people you were going to use on the site. And when you, it was often hard to anticipate what someone was going to do on the site. And then the land use could change. Someone at another <laughs> temperature, so they, they might be. But you'd certainly get caught if you came with a building consent for a car wash facility or something mm -hmm. because you trigger the, the, because we can charge them on the building consents. So, but there's, very few examples that we go over 10 cubic metres per day. All right, just, just to wrap up, I suppose, it, the key message is that this is largely driven by our forward-looking capital programme um, and what the cost of those projects are for growth. 
and then whether or not we can stick with our policy, which is growth is always 100% funded by growth. I guess the choices are if we have a large growth program and this fee is not acceptable, um, the option is to fund it then by rates or to reduce your growth areas and <laughs> program. That's kind of the world in which will be worked through to the LTP. Does that make sense? Sandra. Um, these projects are all intergenerational. And so how do the next generations pay for the, the portion of it as well too? Yep, so this is just this just funds the upfront build cost, renewals, depreciation, uh, maintenance, operation. It's all funded by rates per normal, but you've got those new properties also contributing to that. So your renewals and depreciation mean that the users of the plant are using it over their life. The next generation will be in a position where they can renew it if those funds are still available. So this is just about how do we fund the initial build. In the debt repayment, I mean, the sort of debt, so they inherit the debt. <laughs> Isn't that, is that part of it? The, inherit, the debt tied to the growth is also recovered through DCs. So. No, I was just going to say, so I think Aidan's asking, are we happy with the DC policy? Is that correct? Yes, uh, so, so at this point, we're, options, we're reviewing the policy. We haven't identified any particular problem areas that need changing. Last time around, as Roger says, we simplified how we dealt with commercial premises because we were seeing a whole bunch of problems. Uh, this time around, it seems to be going OK. Uh, people are kind of comfortable, at least with, with the current rates. Um, they want some assurances that the money's being spent in their area, which is fair. Um, so there's no policy changes that we've identified. It's largely what will the rate be based on the capital program that we'll need to review. I, I have to say commercial developers are not entirely happy because I can tell you now that it's a lot more than $40,000. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. Maybe talk to you offline about it though so I make sure that I'm on the right track. Yeah. If that's all right. But what we'll typically do is we'll we'll sit down with anyone who's got um, interest in changes to the policy and see what their issues are and explore them. So yeah. that's probably a process we'll kick off soon. Okay. See what their issues are and see what our options are. Right. Quick question on the policy settings around land in kind mm. as opposed to cash, the DC. There must be a point at which we go, you know what, we've got enough reserve land because every section of land that's given is the gift that keeps on giving because there are ongoing capital costs that falls to the Parks and Reserves team with that. So I'm, I'm interested in where the line is within the policy around, you know what, Actually, we don't want your land, we want your money because we've got enough reserve space. So where, where's that sit? I've touched on a couple of things you might have more. So um, first of all, any infill areas, areas that are largely already developed, but people are subdividing, putting in more houses. We've determined we've got enough reserves, we don't want any more land. Well, what's that for? They're not going to be able to give you anything anyway, but we get a small cash, cash fund that improves the existing reserves. In greenfield areas, We've come up with a charge that's supposed to reflect the new reserve land that we'll need. Um, I think we've got stricter policy now around what land we do accept, make sure it is top quality. Um, but that's principally how we deal with it. The greenfield areas are the areas where we do need reserve land, and we we hopefully structure plan it out in terms of what we need. And then elsewhere, we, we collect the money. We did quite a lot of work on it last time and came with 4%, so approximately the land area that we, we wanted for reserves, so there was a good level of service. So that's charges based on 4% of the land share. Um, in terms of the credit that comes back, that's that's capped at the maximum that they owe us. We don't pay them anything extra if they give us 5 or 6%. That's, that's sort of on, the, on it. Um, yeah, and as, as Aidan said, in, in the areas where we don't need reserve land, like in the Taupo Central area, um, you just pay $1,000. That's, that's not 1% charge. Sorry for the jar. I guess what I'm hearing is that we've got some comfort that where we don't want the land, we want the money instead. Our existing policy settings enable us to make that decision. We have three associated charges with reserves. One is there is the land charge, the community infrastructure, and the, the district wide parks. Which, so we collect some money from everybody for the the, the main feature, like the Tongariro domain, where you've got the play area there, or you maybe things facilities at Island Lane Park and other other community facilities like the library. So everybody pays that. But in terms of reserve land that's local, you you pay. Pretty much just to the need to the area. So if we don't need the land, we don't 
pay it. And, and there's only a few areas that actually do pay the 4%. And in and the back of the development competition policy, there's a map that shows the areas liable. Yeah, I'm leveraging off what, sorry, um, yeah. what Andrew just said. So we do have the ability to go, no, thank you for the offer, but we want the cash within the existing policy. It's generally dealt with in the resource consent when they come in and propose that the post uh, give us a scheme plan and said we'd like to give you a reserve and we actually says no, it's reserved just over the side there. We don't need a reserve off you. We're not taking it. So you put sections on it, pay us the money. Thank you. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. So I just wonder if the key message for today is um, we're starting the review of our DC schemes. To date, we haven't reviewed haven't found anything that we desperately believe that was, needs to be changed. Um, however, we will come back. We've said a couple of times when we're doing our CapEx work, we haven't got to the funding aspect of our CapEx program. <laughs> and once we have done that, we'll come back to council and say, okay, we've been through our CapEx program, we've looked at the percentage of our cap capital projects that would be growth, and then we can look at our policy levers around funding is that that's kind of what you want from today is that exactly so that, that's, this was an introduction to what yeah. is coming on and that's where they're now they're just getting yeah. and probably the other key message but i think we should be thinking is um don't look at dcs like that's an opportunity for additional funding when you're thinking about your capex program because there's not much um yeah. levers that you, you want council to think about is that uh, the right answer yeah. 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 yeah cool <laughs> Okay, I'll just do this one a brief question. Maybe I brought it from last time. Uh, reserves that seems to fund a grass patch and nothing else, like playgrounds or maybe you want to level it for a soccer pitch or something. That's all extra, extra expense on everyone else to fork out. That's, that's, that's kind of how it works, isn't it? That's one of the changes we made uh, in 2021 where we included a cash charge to fund the playground. Oh, previous, oh, so previously, are, we did we got a lot of land and we couldn't do much with it. Yeah, right. Now we yes. did get some cash as well and improve it. And oh, right, right. So. You would need to change your DC policy to include the projects that you wanted uh, to capture that money for. To include it in the oh, oh, but we're not just not just a fund. Yeah, you, you, like, okay, this X reserve in the middle of a subdivision, EUL, say, you want to build a playground or something, you're not just getting 400 bucks off each developer towards a playground. You actually had a project in the early... Uh, yeah. At the moment, we've got a reasonably high level line item in the LTP for development of playgrounds in particular areas. But um, yeah, anything we collect for must be mapped with oh. spare the churn out. Oh, we'll give you just, we'll give you a general description for the whole district. Is that what the line item is? There's more detail behind it. Of yeah, where do we think okay. those playgrounds will be? It's, it's, okay, okay. You can make up. Okay. You need to have plan and so that's why we're starting with our capex program to look at the projects that we would want to fund then the team will look at the breakdown of funding for those projects and work out let's say something random uh, work out whether the portion of that park is associated with growth whether it's associated with an increase in level of service that will then look at the funding opportunities where we identified as a portion that's allocated to growth that kicks off to the DC. So we can't go around the other way and just go, hey, we'd like to get some money. We have to start with that which is why we come to you first. Okay. In areas um, like you know, a Tuangi where you didn't expect growth, um, but you've actually got okay services, haven't you? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, so the DC has been a, a fixed charge on a residential section, for instance, that was developed. Like we've got, you know, as you know, lots of new houses going in down there at present. Um, so each one of those residential sections will be paying a fixed charge, will they? So at the moment we had adequate water capacity yeah. and wastewater capacity, so there's no charge for those. It was just the transport charge and a contribution to reserves. And uh, so but, the transportation charge is exactly the same across the whole district. Yes. And then there's and the reserve charge. So how do you work it out in an area like Turangi, where you're not going to get any more reserves down there, because the reserves down, well you're not, no, because the reserves are all vested in Nati Turangi Tukua. So why would people in Turangi be paying a reserve charge? 
They are paying a reserve land charge at the moment. Yeah. That'd be the district. Oh, just just one. District wide. The split of the three charges is a parks. The two Angi doesn't have a land charge for reserves at the moment, to the best of my knowledge. So there's a thousand dollar charge for infrastructure on existing reserves, and there's a almost a thousand dollar charge for district wide parks. Not not for not to acquire not any more land. land because we have no plan to buy or acquire any more land. So the charge that you're making against two rangy properties is for looking after what you've got there. No, it should be for building new equipment. For building new equipment. Yeah. Putting new playgrounds in place, um, doing land development, shade sales, whatever it is that you can identify for it. And there's a there's a pool of that for two rangy, for instance. Talk to the accountants for that one. But, Sorry? But yeah, we should be identifying. Because I've seen Turing as being different actually yeah. from the rest of the district, which it is. Yeah. Um, um, because of the situation we have down there. So, um, you but you still gather money on the same rate as you would in Hungakino, for instance. Yep. Thank you. And I think the same principle holds with expect to be spending that much in there. Okay. So I need to think about this some more. <laughs> it is ring fenced that money for, you know, is that what you're saying? I don't know if it is for parks. Is this the, I don't administer the parks once being an infrastructure, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, there's the, you know, Agnes has actually got the policy, they get quite the exact figure that they're paying, but the, they only they pay two of the three charges that are related to parks and community infrastructure. One is district wide parks, which is the Island Delaney Parks, and the other is the community infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is the Great Lakes Centre or other community projects that are associated with have a growth component of them. So my understanding is that the touring component is only those two smaller charges. But then there was a large um program at the moment or a playground being implemented in Turangi. So no, I don't know about the finances to where the reserves money, but there is a reserves money to allocate to growth projects to support improvements on the on the reserves. But, but the same question has come around from Kinlock. How much yeah. have they paid? What is the money being used for? Yeah. Um, that's an exercise I think do for Turangi as well. I mean it's a catch of twenty two because the whole purpose of one rating district is that it's each according to their needs. So obviously people contribute um, <clears throat> um, the same across the district with the expectation that their um, requirements are the same. And so, I mean, that's that's not a trick question. <laughs> I'm not trying to trick you or anything. Um, if it's Paul for Turingi, then that's not really what the one rating district's about, is it? It's about each according to their needs across the district. Yeah, development contributions have got quite a different framework where you should be paying or the costs that you're opposing. So we're required to ring fence it within reason to particular areas that are causing the need for the cost and charging to those areas. So there are some areas where we do pull like transport where it's complicated. Um, but generally we do target particular areas, particularly for water waste. Yeah. Okay. Just moving along. One, one last comment to the chair if I might just on um, the comment about the industrial and commercial areas, just to make it clear that people pay the charge when they got their resource consent is the, is the policy that they apply to. So if you they had a resource consent that may be valid for five or six years, if my position in 2017, you'll pay under 2015 policy. If you had a, got a resource consent between 2018 and 2021, you're locked in to the to that charge. So it, so you, anybody under after 2021, with their resource consent pays the 2021 charge. So there'll be people that are coming in still paying legacy charges based on when the particularly multi-stage developments as to when they were first came in. And those those costs don't change. Well, they never go down, do they? <laughs> um, if the if the council votes to go okay. to go down, that they the, the charges could go down. But the only reason it would go down is your decision, and it would be a result of cutting your CapEx program that is associated with growth, or to be um, charging those costs not to developers but onto the ratepayers. So those <laughs> would be the only options you've got. And yeah, just in this new follicle and update policy, so we have got a development and there's no swings or whatever. This is what you say is going to cover it, uh, going to have a spot on there, or you reckon through the CapEx program? 
that we need to identify those areas, do we? Because yeah, Narada is a classic example, beautiful houses, all that, but nothing better land. Then we've had to come in later and pay for the swings. So, so, so under the current policy, it? we now collect a thousand dollars per lot to yeah. fund those swings. Okay. Um, so we should have plans in place for greenfield areas where we go. Here's, here's the park, and yes, we're going to have a playground on there, right. and that money will be used for the location. Cool. Very good. No other questions? Moving on. What's next, Dave? Eh? Oh, you got one. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, the second part of this is looking at our rates for emission policies. Um, so today we'll be taking you through each of the rates for emission policies. Tony will be providing that overview. Um, we'll be looking at two areas that we've we've identified that we will be looking at for review um, and just explaining that policy development process there. Um, and so yeah, I will hand over to Tony to um, start stepping you through um, each of the remission policies that we have in place. Oh, good morning, Tony. Um, so like this slide says, um, Section 108 and 109 um, of the Local Government Rating Act requires that we have rates for emission policies. Um, so basically what this does is make sure that um, it's fair and equitable. Um, so when people come um, wanting to not pay their rates, we can pull out the policy and we can say, well, it's only under these circumstances that you don't have to pay. And these are them. So... So um, we've got um, the lake bed and the hydro lake rates for emission. Um, there's four properties that are hydro lakes that qualify for emission. Um, they are the lakes that hold the water behind the dam. And so that policy's probably been in about three, three years now that we put it in 2021. Um, so that, yeah, that's the first one that we've got there um, first up. And then the other one, the next one is the rates for emission for community sporting and um, so the community one. Um, anyway, I'll talk to this. Um, so that so that policy um, there's um, 64 properties that qualify for that for that rem that remission, and of the cost and it costs 137 thousand dollars this year. Um, so 64 properties qualify for the sports club remission, and um, yeah. <laughs> Put it on the front, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, just remission means okay. uh, sorry. Well, defined yeah, remission. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So um it's for, it's people that don't have to pay some of their rates. Some yeah, uh, yeah. proportionately. Yeah. From but zero to policy. So so the, this remission yeah. policy that we're talking about right now is for community sporting and other organizations. So it's yeah. the community um organizations in the district. It's the likes of hospice, the hot rod club, the fishing club, the scouts, all those sort of outfits. Um um, and so, and there's six, there, 64 of those. 64, so the likes of um, Darts Club. Yep. Yeah. BMX, those BMX. Are the scouts, that yeah. sort of thing. And the hospice. Yeah, yes. 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 And so, um, and they and they get $137,000 remission amongst them all. Oh, um, that's, that's, that's interesting because they've just been to see me about the refuse charges. Oh. So, I didn't know they didn't pay rates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so we've done a bit of a tweak in there. Um, uh, we we circulated the remission policies um, last, or oh, we you know, circulated them, and you you might have seen in a document that looks like that. And you might have seen. So what we've done is so in recent times, like and not even recent, but for a while now, um, we get a lot of feedback from the sports clubs, etc., who um, have they have to pay per pan you know how you have to pay for your sewage per pan if you're not a residential property and of course they've got lots of toilets because they are a sports club um so two boys two girls or or so or whatever and they the biggest charge is their toilet pans so they're paying no rates because we give them 100 percent remission but they're paying for water and sewer um and so we've uh, thinking about putting in a remission policy for the sports clubs and marae and churches, it's the places that are used in the weekends for community organized, community outfits that have a lot of pans just because of the nature of them. 
um, we have got a slide here that we can find. So uh, for that one, so we're looking at it, so if we were to implement this remission and give them 75% per pan, it would cost another $70,000. You can see there that there's um, these 70 properties that would that would meet this criteria would have um, have got 20, 225 pans. So that's how many tall it's just 70 properties of have, and that sort of gives you an idea of how come it's so expensive for them. Um, so that's we've added that into the remission policy for community sporting sports clubs. Um, we've um, included churches and marae in there. To get... Schools, schools, no. No, no not no. schools. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah, so we're considering that. We've put that in there um, to see whether what you guys think of. Have you had any requests for new, you know, properties that? For emissions and transporting for the toilet pans, yeah. Well, you know, you're often that's the biggest problem for them. They get they they have to bring the application form in every two years, um, and then but they've got all those toilets and they're paying um you know full charges for it, um, and so we do we do so the churches, marae and sports clubs all often we hear from them saying the rates are high because of the toilets. But all they're paying is toilets and water. Mm -hmm. And basically, the point is that they're intermittent use. So, yes. you tend to a residential property where people are there yeah. frequently, yeah. Um, they're potentially intermittently mm -hmm. um, and for a community venture. Um, just to share, during the last LTP, we had a discussion about um, this thing as well, mm -hmm. particularly in Marae, mm -hmm. and that perhaps that they be encouraged to have. Um, Marae response plans in place as part of being able to have full remission on rates. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. how that would work, but it's always been something that has stuck in my mind. That's right. And but I think churches have that too. Um so yeah, so yeah, and you're dead right. Yeah. They can help the community in in a um, in the event. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. they're going to be places where people yeah. go. So yeah. Well, I mean like a trade off they they agree to be part of that and then they get a so they, yeah, um, you make yourself more resilient by having a response plan in place, then we'll be a good neighbour. And then we'll give you a remission, did we say? Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah right. we talked about it last time, I can't remember what. Um, it's, around, it's around the marae being open to the public for, for, to help in an, in an emergency, oh. um, and so it's a goodwill, you know, or, yeah. but yeah. churches are the same. Yeah. Mm. Okay, okay, so... <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, the risk of oh, Taupo Lake Bed. Uh, uh, no, no. We, so there's a remission policy for the Taupo Lake Bed and the and these three hydro lakes. Um, so they're all in. They were the first one that I talked about. Um, and so that's the current remission policy. Um, we've the hydro lakes have been in for since 2021. Um, the reason they came in on to get remission is that they um, have got um, easements to hold water, and so suddenly they got a title. And they became raidable. And so um, before that, they, they were just the river bed, so they weren't on the roll at all. So they had to come on the roll. And um, so we've um, got, got that remission policy in there. So there's a, sorry, sorry the, the, so the, the lake, the main lake, you're saying there's a rate, uh, the fee, sorry, for storing water? Is it? Oh, <laughs> so the, sorry, that's the hydro lakes one. So yeah. because the lakes are um, available, open to the public, and there's free public access, so Hydro Lakes and Lake Taupo, yeah. um, the remission is applicable for those as it stands today. Um, that's what that's the remission policy that we have in at the moment. We can change it. Yeah, so we're just going over what's got what we've got now, yeah. um, just because some you know, not all councillors re can remember or um, know um, which one what where our remission policies are. So the next one's for the extreme financial hardship, and basically this is for low-income owners, um, earners, sorry, and um, owners of properties um, that have been in the district for 10 years or more, and um, they don't own any other properties in the district, um, and we have no one who has got that, has, has applied for that um, extreme financial hardship postponement. Anyone on that? No one. No. 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 Does anyone know about it? So. Well, it's on our emission policy, it's on our website. Oh, 
Um, so with them, we've got rem uh, the remission policy for penalties. So um, if you don't pay your rates on time, you get a 10% penalty. You get that on each instalment, um, just on the amount that's owing on each instalment. And then at the end of the year, if you haven't paid, um, you get a 10% penalty on everything you owe. Um, so at the last um, instalment, on instalment one, we um, 1,420 people got a penalty. Um, uh, 472 of those had previous years arrears and 948 they were first timers. Um, so we remitted 230 of those penalties. Um, so you can write in, of, and because of this remission policy that I'll explain in a minute, and 119 of those people went on direct debit. So we we write to them individually and say that the people, so the 948 who have just forgot to pay, because usually they do, um, we write to them and say, hey, it looks like we forgot. Would you like to go on direct debit? If you do, we'll remit your penalty. And we managed to get 119 of those to sign up. So the um, remission policy for um, penalty, well, penalty remission policy is just covers off if someone was sick at the time. Um, if you were, if there was an office error, um, if you paid electronically and it went somewhere else, if that, if that happens. Um, yeah, and so those are the stats around that remission policy. Um, we've also, the next one is rates remission and post. Before you go any further. Um, you talked about arrears from the previous years. Mm -hmm. How many did you say you had? So there? this just last instalment. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There was um, 472 people that had arrears from previous years. We've just gone to, so what happens also if you've got um, arrears um, and you've got a mortgage, we can um, ask the bank for your mortgagee for the money. We asked 200 he, 180 people, uh, 180 people were in that category. It's 25,000 ratepayers are they've since paid, so we're down to about 80. And I would say by the 1st of November, by the time they we can actually ask the bank for the money, they'd probably be down around 60 people. So those people, are they made aware of the postponement for extreme financial hardship? Yes. You make that clear that they can apply. Yeah, and a rate rebate. Yes, and a rate rebate. Right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the one we're up to now is the rates remission and postponement on Māori freehold land. So I'll just give you a bit of a, a background on Māori freehold land. So this is where it's not it just it hasn't this land hasn't got a general uh, title general title. Their title is held in the Māori Land Court. Um, you can't buy Māori freehold land. Um, the, the way land Māori freehold land changes ownership is through succession. When someone passes away. Um, you can apply to the Māori Land Court to succeed to the land, the whānau can. Um, in some cases, they don't succeed. They don't ask to succeed to the land because some, you know, maybe there's sometimes rates of rears. Um, I don't know. There's lots of reasons why people don't succeed. But then the land is there. We don't know who the owners are. We don't know how to get hold of anybody. Um, that sort of situation happens. It never happens with general land. Um, so we've got a rates remission policy for Māori freehold land. Um, and it's on four parts of Māori freehold land. So um, some blocks of Māori freehold land are really big and someone lives on one piece of it. So we split the property into two parts and we remit the rates on the bit that's unused um, and just charge the rates on the bit that's used. And that's what this remission policy is referring to. And um, this year we've um, given $81,000 worth of remission to um, unused Māori parts of Māori freehold land and there's 56 properties. Sorry, is this mostly rural? So, yeah, mostly. Stuff? Yeah, mostly. Yes, not really. Isol isolated here, yeah, mostly. Yeah, and large. So, when you say eighty-one thousand, that would be if it were um, rurally or farmland rated. That that's what we would have got eighty-one thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got to be not in production or the not right. being used. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't wasn't thinking. So yeah, um, it's got to have multiple owners. Um, no income derived um, in its natural state to qualify. Um, and they have to apply every three years. So typically you might have money to move or something, or there might be a reason, or it just there's been difficult to get a decision to actually move it into a space where hundreds of owners can all agree to come. That's right. So does your team go out and check that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can't find someone to come to ask for remission, yeah. we'll go out and take photos and um, rather than keep the deed on the books. Um, but we do our best to try and contact people and get some owners in there. But, you know, some people don't want their name on it because they don't want the debt 
to, with their name by the debt. Um, so yeah, well, it's, it's a tricky one, but um, that's, this is this remission policy helps us deal with that. And um, like I say, there's 56 of those properties and 81,000 this year. So if someone's living, living on us, no remission. Yeah, yeah, right. mm. yeah, doesn't qualify. If it's used in any way, no, no remission. It's got to be unused. So does that allow for? I'm looking at the lake bed there. There's a race remission for the for the lake bed, but it is used commercially. Yeah, so, so yeah, the hydro lakes that and the lake bed. Well, um, yes, they're both in the same situation where they're camping income. Um, however, the um, they're open to the the, the remission policy as it stands now is is that it's um, publicly open, open to the public and you, anybody can go there. Yeah. So it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, but we've got leases and um and charge of back to two thirty four for the use of the lake and the lake bed, and so that's commercial. Does that get rated at all, or is it just a blanket rates remission for the lake? Blanket rates. In terms of the current policy, is what we're explaining. <laughs> is there a chance to debate that mm -hmm. substantive? Yep. Well, we had I had a direct query about that, which is yeah. why I raise it. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And when does the, when does the time yeah. to move? So, so at the end, I know because I've seen these slides, right at the end, yeah. we're talking about we're coming to you today again, you know, workshop setting. We're coming today to give you a heads up on what the current policies what the current, are, yeah. what the processes we're undertaking. We would like to go and oh, I won't spoil the surprise. <laughs> What's next? Um, yeah. But you've got a process to work through. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> <laughs> Just wait for the end. <laughs> next slide. Next You'll be surprised. <laughs> um, so it's not the next slide. It's the um, Maori tree called being called being has been developed. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So the next one is. Um, Māori freehold land, uh, which is undeveloped. Obviously, we don't rate it at the moment. Um, and there was a new change to legislation um, about what happens when it is being developed. So once it is developed, we do rate it. When it's not developed, we don't rate it. But what happens in the middle while it's being developed? So currently, we've got a remissions policy, which applies kind of a complicated sliding scale, where we go out and we value it at different stages of its development. And we apply 80% remission in the first year, dropping back down, and by year five, you pay whether you finish development or not. Um, the intention of the, the law changes is that, um, first of all, anyone who's developing the Māori land is supposed to encourage Māori land development. They're allowed to apply to council for a remission. There's things we're required to consider, and we have to consider that application. Our current policy kind of does that. But the intention was that this should really just be 100% remission unless you've got a reason not to. Um, and we're talking about a really small amount of money, a couple of hundred dollars over the period it's developed. And then obviously once it is developed, it falls into the rating pool like anything else. Um, this has never actually been used, is my understanding. So we've got this quite complicated policy um, that would be hard to administer, but it's not used. So it's, it's neither causing a problem nor being particularly helpful. Um, and the question is, now that the law change has happened and that this has been more publicised and that there's been an intention that this is now available to people to go for, would it make sense to make it more simplified and just over 100% remission while it's been developed? And then once it is developed, they will pay rates. So um, that's a conversation we're beginning to have. Do we charge development contributions on this as well? We do, and that's, that's where this gets a bit awkward. So we're saying, don't worry about your couple hundred dollar bill. By the way, here's a several thousand dollar bill. Yeah. So I don't know if um, he, will, he will be aware of that. I think they'll be expecting to get a lot of discount, but currently in our DC policy, we give no waivers. So um, on the basis that they're, they're true costs, and if you don't fund them, then rates have to fund them. So there's no waiver for even land under development, they will pay a DC charge, um, whether or not we, we charge them for the rates while it's been developed. I don't think it's a good discussion. Sorry. Quick question on that. But I understand the rationale. It makes sense if we're going to encourage development. Uh, mm -hmm. We would have no remission once it's developed. Define that for me. What's the end date? Well, currently five years. Or uh, you, you would keep that in there, or when you get income. 
or when or when you're living in the house, it's house. And it's so, well, it's soil, basically, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's all um, stepped out in the policy of when the rates become payable. And of course, it'll be from 1 July after. So if it's um, planting, um, as, soon as, as soon as it's predominantly sown, um, the rates from 1 July the next year, it'll become rateable. Um, and, you, and you need a building consent. You, you, you can't just build something and say, I need remission. You need a building consent to our resource consent or all those council things to kick off anyway, or the, to even get the remission. Um, so this is um, so that so anyone can come to the council now and say, hey, I, I own some Māori freehold land. I'd like a remission, please, because because it's the law. Um, and what this is doing today is we're formalising these. Okay, we have to, we have to consider your remission, but these this is what you have to do. You have to have a building consent. Um, once as soon as you've built the house and you're living there, you know, and it's predominantly built, and there's value there. You have to pay um, and all and setting it all out just to keep it there across the board. Yeah, I was just talking about. Yeah. But we are in a situation where we've now got buildings that don't require building consent on land, and you can have a number of those buildings on land without building consents, can't you? Under 30 square metres? Well, not if someone's living in it. Yeah, so you wouldn't qualify if someone's living there. If someone's living there, yeah. it, it, it goes into a whole different basket, does it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. No, just another question. <clears throat> so, what about, say, if a uh, public whanga was developed, which was kind of not a marae, but operating like one, so it's not, um, no one lives there permanently, but it's kind of there to use the same way that you use marae. What happens in that situation? Um, so the law's really clear, it can't be lived in. Yeah, yeah. no mm -hmm. one's living there. And it's, yeah, well, it can't be used as a residence. And if it's used like marae. So they pay rates on water? Wastewater and, and refuse, yes. but not the general rate. All right. Thank you. Uh, did, we, did we finish off? No. no, no. Um, so um, the council utilities, so um, that's our own pipes, the three quarters. Um, we remit $705,000 um, because it's just if we charge it, then we've got to charge it, everybody to pay it. So it's just um, fixing that up. And water leaks, we've got a water leak remission policy, which is very good. A lot of people that um, have leak um, can take a photo of them of it fixed or and get the plumbers received to us, and we can remit. The, um, so what we do is we get what you will you usually have paid, and, and the difference, we remit it. Um, and the next one we've got water leaks. That's a big office. So that's your rural properties and your CBD, CBD properties. Um, and so we've got the natural disasters remission policy, um, and that's basically you have to be residential, um, and the ground that you're on, something's happened to that, um, you have to apply, um, and um, that, yeah. Um, so that's just safeguards us, and if something major happens and um, people, residential ratepayers um, can't pay their rates, we can offer some sort of help. Um, we haven't used that one yet, and it's been in for probably six years. We don't have to. Um, and then last but not least is the Waitā Nui Water one. Um, there were 200 properties out at Waitā Nui who um, we wanted them to connect to Topo Town Water. Um, and um, so far, 120 of those have connected, and the other 80, um, we are remitting the half charge because they've got their own supply. So this is different um, from usual, you know, when you've got a usual um, a property that's got services or got the services running past and it's vacant. These people already had their own water supply. They didn't need council's water supply and um, council got money from the government to put the pipe out there. So um, this is just the hangover from that. So there's 80, 80 people still using their own water. Can I just go back to the natural disasters yeah. rates from issue? Okay. Because the issue with that, as I understand it, it's not about people not being able to afford their rates. It's about the fact that the house company lived in any longer. Yeah. So we will still do it in that case, that yeah. the house company lived in, That's even though they yeah. might be perfectly capable of paying the rate. Yeah. It is, because that was the issue in Auckland, wasn't it? People were getting rates bills, couldn't live in their homes. Okay. Sure, sure. It's, and that stepped out in the policy. Explain to them. Right. Okay. Thank you. But that doesn't apply to anything other than residential. That's right. So, thank you for that explanation on those remaining 80 at Waitanui. Mm -hmm. Given we've just recently made a decision by Fire Bay from an equity point of view, 
How do we sit there? Well, the difference there was that the government gave us one point nine million or something to put the pipe in it down at Waitangi. Um, yeah. So, you know, we couldn't say no, thank you. We don't want your one point nine million. Um, we had we were obligated to put the put the water on, and then there was all those people out there that were adamantly didn't want the water. Um, whereas, why I think quite well, they they were they were quite keen to um, connect. And they start, oh, I, get, I get that, but the same, the pipe goes right past Five Mile Bay, and, and we, we've debated this pro and, and con, and then decided we've removed the charge, or whatever we're going to charge for Five Mile Bay, and put it on the same footing as Waitanui. But in terms of this is the next step, then the question that would arise quite naturally why then wouldn't we apply the same remission policy to Five Mile Bay? Residents that we do to white and residents, like the same fees. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I can answer that precisely, but I thought it's important to add that most of the people in white and know that we're saying when they when they come to servicing or upgrading their water, their own water supplies, they actually decide it's not worth it. They do connect to the system and then use it, and they become full users and pay the full rate. So I I'm not quite answering your question, but I thought that was no, I wasn't trying to. I was just trying to say that's that's also <laughs> that's relevant that's information. That's so that probably will go away. As people, as everyone gets yeah. onto it, then there'll be What's no the discrepancy. What, what's she saying? Are we charging them a full? Yeah. So they're yeah. So they're paying if they connected, they're paying a full charge. If the water is available to them, but they're not connected, they're paying a half charge. They didn't. We didn't put a remission policy in for them. But, and I know. From memory, and I'm nervous because I'm in front of everybody. Um, um, well, so it was part is the government the 1.9 million dollars um, that got that got funded from the government to put the White one in. Um, yeah, but, um, and so we needed the we needed the community to to come on board mm -hmm. and and do it because we had the money and we wanted them connected um, and get them clean um, drinking water. Um, and so the only the way to get that through was to put that half charge for the remission because the Already struggling paying the rates. Yeah, what's Kevin's question? What's your question? Well, it's, it's my big question. I, I, I get that, mm -hmm. and irrespective of where the money came from, the money is there and the pipe is there. And we had a debate around the it was an equity decision around is it appropriate to connect for free? Um, Waitanui, when the pipe goes right past five mile bay, but if you want to join, we're going to charge you extra. And we agreed, yes, we'll do that. And then we had a, a rethink about it and we took that charge off. Mm -hmm. So having put them on the same footing as Waitahanui residents, irrespective of where the money came from or where the pipe is, the pipe's there. So my question is, is it equitable to go same pipe, same conditions for everything else to go, you don't want to connect, we will remit the half charge if you live here, but the same pipe, same conditions, but if you live here, we won't. That's my question. Can I just point out Five Mile Bay isn't the only other, the Bay of Whakamaru was the recent example where we've extended the waterline. Uh, when we did that, we consulted with the community, do you want this? If you do, the catches, even if you don't connect, you'll be paying the half charge. There's a whole bunch of vacant lots out here who aren't connected who are also paying half charges. So half charges are the norm, and Waitahanui is the exception. Um, so it would be about whether or not you change Waitahanui to match the general rather than change your five mile bay. Well, so most of the question then. The compelling, and I hear that we want to encourage them to connect, but if the argument for remitting the half charge is that they have uh, an already perfectly functioning water system and they don't wish to connect. That applies to these other people as well. Because Five Mile Bay, there's a lot of people there who spent 20 grand plus on a new system, but we're not remitting their half charge. So I'm looking for the compelling argument to go. The government, sorry, there's a low deprivation in Waitanui. Well, thank you. So that, that if that's what we're going to leverage off, then let's be. Completely yeah, transparent easy. that that's why we're doing it. But at the moment, I'm not convinced that actually there is a compelling argument for do this for one community and not another. But if we've got the, the rationale for doing it, that's fine. But I think we need to be quite transparent about we are doing this for these reasons. These are the reasons. Mm -hmm. So, me, it says that in the remission policy. Seven to go in the morning. Yep.
um, section two. <laughs> <laughs> and just, I know, I know this is about the remissions policy, but just given the about connecting to safe drinking water and given the directive around protozoa and whatnot, how do people have the option not to, that, you know, you must connect drinking water. If they if they get sick, the whole total reputation is at risk, right? So why don't they have to? I think they can force people into it. Yeah. They've got their own rules to Yeah, that was part of the problem um, with Waitangi yeah. is they, they didn't want to connect. They had their own water supply and spent money on it. Um, and so the, the way to get this in and across the line was to offer yeah. a remission policy for those who didn't want to connect because they had their own water. And I suppose the onus is on them if they do get sick and it's their own water. Um, but yeah. as Andrew says, now they're coming to replace their schemes and systems mm. and got to get it checked and yeah. all that sort of cost them money. Yes. Well, just join up. Yes. So, so, thank you. Yes, I've just read it. So it's the last two bullet points in 9.1 in the policy. Are we applying that uh, consistently across the district in other lower socioeconomic um, areas or other areas with where the deprivation index applies? Equally to Waitahanui. Yeah, so these, so the, um, the only reason you would have an availability charge is if you're not connected. Yep. So that would be a vacant section. So if you're, if you're the owner of a vacant section, yep. you're Quite probably easy. different from a person living in a house down in Waitahanui that's got a have got their own pub. You know. Oh, and through the chair, since then we've changed to a district wide order. Right, Especially so everyone's the same. same. Even those who are not connected, pay half. Those are the ones that pay half. Yeah, so generally the people that aren't connected are the people that own uh, uh, vacant sections. Well, basically that's who's not connected. And so when you when you want to build, so you get the um, water connected so you can build, and then from 1 July the following year you start paying for water. Is Pipeline Bay connected to me? It's connected now, but there are people with their own private schemes. Yeah. Like my yeah. family, same with Akma, there are people with their own private schemes who aren't choosing to connect. Yeah. You know, they get hit by a big bill with their own scheme. And if, just for clarification, so if but if you're at Waitahanui, you're not paying that half charge at the moment. No, we charge it and remit it. I see Kevin's point. And, yeah, and part of the reason for that is when we connected Five Mile Bay and when we connected Waitahanui, we could consult with the community and say, look, this is the financial impact from our policy. Do you want us to do this project or not? Whereas with the wide I knew it was government funded project that was going to happen. Otherwise, they would have just said, no, it's not happening. We did it with government funding. So it wasn't that conversation around whether or not this project would happen or not. The project happened because of the funding. So. Look, I, I agree with the policy. I think it, it's good policy and it's done for the right reasons, having just refreshed my memory reading it. But my question remains, are we being consistent across everyone else that would fall into that level of the deprivation index and other lower socioeconomic. And I, I get with the empty section, but you know, if there are other areas within the district that this applies, are we applying an equitable policy setting there? Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the only reason we got the pipe down is because the government. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's just like. Five more value resident rings you and say, Hey, why am I paying for this white Well, you'll have to just say it's because it's white low deprivation area. It's going to be white. You know, you've got those yeah, multi million dollar properties sitting on the lake there. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, to be eight, 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 eight. Eight. Yeah. Well, the government does that designation yeah. So I guess to that, well, from my perspective, today was about telling you what yeah, your well, problems well, are. Yeah. So what I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, no, no, I think it's good because I think yeah. what I'm hearing is actually this is one that you do want to stay and mm. go, please go away, actually justify that we're still happy with the decision that's been made previously and whether that's consistent or inconsistent with decisions made since that policy came in. So, so I think that's good. That's what that's the purpose of today um, is, is to get that view from you. Yeah. The other part is, though, what have we promised that community? You know, we've already made promises to that particular community to try and get that project across the line. So, yeah. So I wonder if we can look at our, our financial hardship rates postponement instead, and then that can be applied where the need is rather than a general blanket. That area's pretty high bar. 
Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be like, if I lived in Waitangi, there wouldn't be a thousand times if I find any hardship. Same same thing, Yeah. 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 You already know you're going to find Anyway. Just on talking about that, you know, there's two different issues here. There's issues about actually charging for rates and uh, water and who pays and all the rest of it. And then there's the other side of the coin, which um, Councillor Park just brought up, which is about actual quality of water and making sure that people have safe water and access to safe water. And we've got um, what we understand is El Nino arriving on the scene. I don't know what patients access to down there, whether it's actually from a stream or whether it's from their rooftops. Um, I was involved in a district once where water was put through and it was mandatory. There was no opting out of it. And so what happened was we got a pipe that came through onto our section and had a tap on it and you were connected to the town water. We still use our own water that we collected because we had pump system in one place, but it was mandatory. There was no, it was it was mandatory. There was no discussion over it. And the argument was safe water. And eventually, of course, when the pump gets out, tanks get old, and you can't be bothered anymore. Well, it's already connected, and you can go and get the water. Um, yeah, we so, tried to do that for Waitangi, but we got delegations in saying our water is the best in the country. And, uh, well, it is until it isn't. Fluoride, you know, that's fluoride, all that sort of thing. Got, yeah. And, and we got this nightly going on Queenstown from absolutely pristine, beautiful water, which we all know is pristine and fabulous. So it's not. Yeah. So I think there's two issues here, and I think the issues actually, like the taxi, is something that we should be exploring because we have a responsibility for our community and our citizens to provide them with safe drinking water that they can 100% rely on. But we kind of need to wait and see what happens with the three waters too, because well, don't they so have to get their standards up as well if they want to open You might be you're absolutely right, Mike, but it might be right. But, you know, I've lived in countries where you, you wouldn't, where you wouldn't clean your teeth with the water, mm. you know, and, and, and use beer instead, which was a <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, it's two issues. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would be the ideal situation, but why can't they take back quite considerably at the time? And uh, we came to the conference, yeah. which I think is slowly taking a while to get in, but as the injury says, they're slowly coming on the other. Mm. Well, you know, the pipe just goes to this section and there's a tap there. Yeah, well, that's what happens now. Water. You don't have to use it. Yeah. But you've got access to it, and we provided yeah. you with that. Well, in actual fact, that's what the story is at Waikanae. Mean, they've got access now, haven't they, all of them? Yeah. That's right. So I think we've done all of the infrastructure for them to connect. Yeah, yeah. But the question of the, the properties that aren't connecting aren't taking it, we're not charging. Mm. Well, what if you don't want the fluoride? So yeah, I'm, that's what I want the fluoride. Well, it's a minute three. That was the point that I was making. We continued to use our own water, even though we had a council collection. We used the council collection for the garden. I never said that. <laughs> so every, every property of Waitangi has got access to the council water, just some haven't. haven't so it's between yeah. access and actually being available. It was available. There was a tap there that you could turn on right. and you could use it if you wanted to. Yeah. Sorry, and you popped up. Again. Oh, no, I was just going to say, we just need to be make sure everyone understands what access means, right? So I, I don't believe at the moment you can you can yeah. just turn on a tap no. and no. get access to yeah. the water. Yeah. But yeah. it is a small, yeah. minor yeah. issue to connect to that tap. It's not a huge barrier for people who do want it. So, and then, right. of course, there's that great rebate scheme where people can get $750 to pay yes. for the rates. Um, so that's this year. And so, so far, we've um, processed uh, close to 800 of those. Um, and um, the government have paid close to 600000 to those people. So um, there is that for low-income earners as well. How does that work? Does that, does they, does we admit the council it. send you a check? Or, um, yep. Oh, so the DIA give yeah. it, send us the money. Send us the money. Yeah. Okay. So every year we've sent out a rate rebate application form to the person, to anybody who qualified last year or even applied, and then they can they need to get it back to us by 30 June the following the end of the year, and they've got the whole year to apply. And so so we sent them out on the first of August with the rates notice, and so far we've got close to 800 back. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that the norm? Is that the norm? What's the norm? Yeah, yeah. So last year we got, come on, eyes are bad. Um, 2,308 all up we got. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll probably get maybe a bit more this year. You've got the over 65 and the limited income. Mm. That's for the postponement. This one is just low income earners. Mm. It depends on what your rates are and, um, and um, what your income is. And it's government funded. We administer it. Cool. So you don't have to be sick. No, no, it doesn't qualify. Right, Katie. Um, allow me to change the subject just briefly. But in each of the policies we've got, it refers to the decision making process, or the process is not out loud, it's outlined. It's just the decision makers are either revenue and finance officers or the revenue and finance manager. Um, not in the policy anywhere that I could find it, but do we have an appeal process and where should that sit within policy and where are the checks and balances around the decision making? Yeah, so these remission policies go through um, legal review every three years, um, so they're there now. Um, so they should be watertight, so you know exactly whether you can qualify or not. Um, if you are qualified for this, I can't say you're not having it, um, because it's clear in here that you you qualify for the rates remission, and that that's how they are written and that's how they they are reviewed. I get that, but mine it's more of a a transparency process question around. Yep, that's fine, but if I'm um, a ratepayer who, for reasons best known to the ratepayer, decides there's nothing on telly, I'm going to read through the rates remission policy for council. <laughs> there, is, there is nothing in here, it's just in, in what we were sent, that tells me if I make an application and it, a decision is made and I want to appeal that, what do I do? Where do I go? How does it work? And I'm not saying we need to put a whole detailed flow diagram in there, but if there is another set of policies that sit off to the side, a legal assurance, do we need to allude to that or, or reference that, or how do we tie this all together? That, that's my question, really. Yeah. I don't have any problem with it. And, and part of that is, is also around um, protection of staff. So if you're in the position of being the decision maker, um, do we have um, protection for that staff member make that decision against accusations of nepotism or conflict of interest or all those good things that sit there? And I'm sure we've got that covered, but it's not mentioned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Social background. Would cut more than But uh, no, good, good, good point because you know who, who does make the decision mm -hmm. to postpone rates. What is it's in the policy? Yeah, it's in the policy, but you have you've got application forms too, um, and so yeah. you're signing the uh, the application form and you're declaring things yeah. on the application mm -hmm. form. No, so the delegation currently is in the finance, so certain amounts are. All right. Okay. Oh, oh, that's it. Um, oh, just a really quick next steps we were going to from here. So, yeah. um, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so with regards to the policy around um, the remission for um free development of Māori freehold land, um, we will be going to talking to our land trust Iwi and Papu around that. Um, particularly the two key things we'll be talking to them about is is how much remission and for how long. So just to just test those two things. Um, we will, we're hoping to do that over the next two weeks, um, get that feedback. Then next steps is we'll take that feedback into the policy development process as well as the, the feedback we've had from you today. Um, and then we'll come back and look to do another workshop around where, where we've got to so that we can, we can keep that going um, before finalising those the, these policies for the next round. And bearing in mind, we're really aligning with legislation that's changed. Exactly. Like, yeah. I'll see this. <laughs> that helps for the two weeks of context. So that's a lot of land trusts that you need to have to do that. Yeah. Who does that? Um, yeah. 
Kara and the, <laughs> the uh, Iwi Co governance team. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be putting them in that process as well, trying to find those and, and, and get those connections going. Um, you know, we've already, we've, we've had a really good early engagement process, so we've got a lot of relationships through that. So that will be really helpful in, in going forward. Um, so yeah, that, that's the process. But as Aidan said, we're, we're happy to have some offline chats if, if need be to understand these policies in more detail, if you've got any particular ones, the development contributions or the remissions. So um, yeah, just give us a call and, and happy to set something up. Cool. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Tan. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan.